Uh, so this module 10, we are going to take uh, information from genes and moving on to networks. Does everyone hear me well? I think the microphone is sort of on and off. So maybe I, I'll stand closer. Uh, some of the objectives that we want to learn through these modules is before we even get into pathway network analysis, we need to make sure that we're calling genes by the right names. And uh, handling gene identifiers is, uh, is a mundane task, but it's a really important one. Um, then the second is that we discuss what, which kinds of gene annotations there are available. So what type of information can we use to interpret genes? Then what is a basic gene enrichment test and how does it work uh, to conceptually understand what we're doing in the context of uh, pathway enrichment analysis? You obviously can use many different tools to run these types of tests. Then why do I need to use uh, uh, multiple testing correction? And, well, we always need to use multiple testing correction because we're dealing with big data. Uh, how do we analyze uh, gene set enrichment results uh, using enrichment map? Uh, we do that because usually these types of results are very redundant and there are many similar um, ideas that need to be clustered together. And then we'll briefly go through general principles of network visualization using the Cytoscape software. This is really about three or four slides, uh, but you can you know, do some hands-on work later on. Um, so here's an introduction um, and uh, the motivation of doing this type of analysis. Uh, in case you have already produced your interesting uh, uh, genome-wide or protein-wide data, then you know that sometimes you get a lot of results. So uh, the main motivation is that my cool new screen work then produced a thousand hits and now do what, what I do. Um, a lot of that uh, preliminary work you already practiced during the workshop. You need to analyze this data carefully to distinguish signals that are you know, going above uh, statistical noise. But then you need to go in and interpret those lists of genes uh, uh, through pathways and networks. And this can be a very challenging task because you can go to PubMed and try to look up a few papers about each of your top genes and you can easily go into hundreds and thousands of papers to read. So pathway network analysis is really a technique to automate that process and maybe do a statistical analysis of keywords, uh, functions, and processes that have been annotated to genes previously. So when we consider this pipeline, you have some uh, raw input data that you have processed carefully using uh, uh, pipelines and algorithms. You perform some sort of a statistical ranking or clustering algorithm on these, uh, on these data in order to extract genes that are uh, coming out with, uh, as the, the ones with the highest statistical signal in some sense. Perhaps they're highly expressed in your disease of interest, uh, or maybe they form specific clusters that you're interested in. And then you use prior knowledge about uh, uh, those genes that has been studied over decades of research um, using certain anal analytical tools, and you may actually come up with a new hypothesis of uh, what a gene might do in the context of a disease, uh, annotate the previously unknown gene, or explain some mechanism uh, underlying the disease. Um, maybe we'll uh, try to clear this uh, first. What is, the, what is a pathway and what is a network? Uh, and I think as many people work on this area, they will have their different uh, definitions. Um, my definition is the following. Uh, when you uh, talk about pathways, then you talk about a fairly small scale system of maybe a few dozen genes. And those uh, few dozen genes have their interactions. And those interactions uh, are fairly well defined. So it may be a phosphorylation event or a transcriptional deactivation event, but each one of those relationships or edges between the different genes have been defined uh, very carefully in, in, uh, in experimental settings. And then that could be an EGFR-centered pathway with the various upstream and uh, downstream members uh, that control EGFR or uh, undergo in the EGFR-related uh, downstream signaling. Now an EGFR-centered network would be a slightly different concept. You would also see um, you know, several genes interacting with EGFR. Mm, however, the, the system may be a much larger scale system, and the edges may be a little bit more vague. So perhaps they're not coming in from individual experiments, but these edges between EGFR and the additional genes or proteins would be coming from, uh, say, a few large scale omics screens. So, the edges are perhaps not as well defined, they're not as high confidence, but those types of large-scale networks may still include additional information that we may find uh, valuable for, for our data analysis and interpretation. Um, so, fairly briefly, what types of network and pathway analysis techniques are available? This is a very diverse field. There are many types of uh, technologies and methods 
and even goals that we can um, uh, um, do to achieve uh, you know better interpretation of data. Uh, this uh, particular uh, classification is coming from a recent, uh, or not so recent, but a review paper from Nature Methods um, in 2015. Uh, the first type of a pathway network analysis is an enrichment of fixed gene sets. So fixed gene sets would be groups of genes that have been annotated previously to carry out a particular function, and then we perform an enrichment test to ask if our experimentally defined list is somehow characteristic of these gene lists. So this is perhaps the most widely used um, and the easiest method to apply because it has fairly few assumptions. And the second, second type of a method would be a de novo subnetwork cl construction and clustering method, uh, in which case we, we have a, a particular set of genes that we're interested in and we're asking which kinds of networks are connecting these genes together. Um, and then the third category would be a pathway-based modeling exercise where we have an existing pathway uh, diagram as a scaffold and we ask if our genes of interest uh, behave according to the rules set, uh, set by that particular pathway diagram. So the third method uh, is perhaps uh, uh, the most specific. It requires you to have a very detailed set of data that you can use, but it can potentially help you model the, your genes of interest using an existing pathway with high detail, assuming uh, that you have a good diagram of the pathway and you have very high throughput and detailed data. Um, so, if we talk about cancer research, uh, what would be these types of uh, pathway network analysis, what questions would they answer? Uh, the first one is fairly simple. Um, if we have analyzed a set of cancer samples, for example, and we have um, come up with a list of genes that's really characteristic of this subtype of cancer, we could ask what kinds of pathways and processes are active in this subtype of cancer. Um, when we do de novo subnetwork construction clustering, we could ask are there certain kinds of new pathways or new networks uh, particularly altered in this uh, set of samples representing a particular cancer subtype? Uh, and perhaps uh, are some of those uh, uh, cancer subtypes clinically relevant in terms of uh, maybe they have a different patient prognosis? Um, and then when we do pathway-based modeling, we can ask uh, how is a pathway activity altered in a particular patient? So do the genes follow uh, a particular regulatory pattern that has been predicted by a known pathway or is the regulatory pattern a little bit different? So when you look at these questions you see that some of them are fairly simple to ask and others require to have a very good insight of the genes and the pathways at hand. So for the rest of the workshop um, the tutorial or session we will actually fo focus on the first class of methods that deal with uh, enrichment of gene sets uh, in your high throughput data. So what does that uh, pathway enrichment analysis really do? Uh, this can be visualized with this really simple Venn diagram, where on the one hand, uh, in blue, you would have a gene list that you identified as being particularly active, for example, uh, in your experiment of choice. Um, and in orange, you would have a previously annotated list of genes that have a certain function uh, or are, are known to be involved in a particular process. Uh, for example, a process could be neurotransmitter signaling, and those genes have been accumulated over time into a particular database. And then using a statistical enrichment test, such as a Fisher's exact test, you would ask, are the neurotransmitter genes particularly highly enriched in my experimentally derived gene list? And if the answer is true, you may pose a new hypothesis that perhaps neurotransmitter signaling is, something, uh, is somehow related to my experiment that actually initially derived that particular list of genes. So perhaps you were doing a, a drug sensitivity assay and then uh, uh, follow up, followed up with RNA-seq experiments, then if genes are differentially regulated and those genes are often related to neurotransmitter signaling, then maybe that poses a new hypothesis. In practice, we actually have many different gene lists, uh, uh, gene sets, each representing a different functional category or molecular uh, function or pathway, and we test many of those uh, gene sets one by one. And each time we may get an enrichment or not, um, and then we need to do a, something called FTR correction or multiple testing correction to derive a more conservative list of findings. And then based on those, we interpret our data, perhaps leading to follow-up experiments or at least explaining what we see in our high-throughput experiments. So, so much about uh, perhaps the very basic background of pathway enrichment analysis. Now we need to go through a few different details that you need to care about 
even before going to the analysis, how do we identify gene re genes reliably? Because these pathway enrichment analyses, they rely on particular uh, gene identifiers and databases to run the functions. Why is it important to identify genes in the right way? This is because genes do not follow um, one particular standard of naming, but genes will have many types of names, many types of identifiers. Uh, then, importantly, these tend to change over time. So some identifiers might become obsolete, and even worse, the same gene may have multiple names, and multiple names may, may belong to different uh, to the same gene. Sorry, that was confusing. The same name may actually belong to multiple different genes. Uh, so what are the issues to keep in mind? What is the output of the experiment that you initially performed? So proteins may have different uh, identifiers compared to transcripts uh, or genes. Uh, Non-coding RNAs will have a, even a different space of identifiers. If your original experiment produced a particular list, a list of identifiers, you may need to convert that list to another list in order to enable pathway enrichment analysis. Um, when you analyze a particular experiment, you may not even be able to directly convert uh, your identifiers to the, uh, uh, to the space that is used by a pathway tool, but you may need to convert it twice or, or multiple times. Each one of those conversions may lead to a certain loss. Um, so the statistical test uh, we will talk about a little later. So what are the identifier mapping challenges we need to worry about? We need to avoid errors. We have to map IDs correctly. And uh, many cases there would be mappings between single gene and multiple alternative identifiers. If you're using an older uh, platform for experimental analysis, some of those identifiers may not map correctly to the current identifiers and therefore lead to losses in your pathway enrichment analysis uh, or worse, that you point to a different gene uh, overall. So gene names are ambiguous, therefore uh, you, see you need to use a particular kind of identifier which would provide just a, a particular identifier per gene and not multiple aliases. Uh, here's an example of the famous uh, tumor suppressor gene P53, which may be called P53, TP53, TRP53, LFS1, and so on and so forth. And some of those are historical and some of them are used in parallel. Uh, so it's important to know about that. Um, there is something in the human space, there's a, a standard nomenclature of genes, uh, which represents these alphanumeric uh, uh, sequences. Unfortunately, that may also change. So genes get uh, occasionally assigned uh, new identifiers, and that can confuse uh, you know, people and algorithms both. And so <coughs> it is sometimes better to use uh, these uh, gene symbols in parallel with actual database identifiers to be able to consistently map your identifiers. Um, you probably, uh, if you have used Excel spreadsheets before, then you know that uh, gene identifiers, if they resemble dates, may be converted to dates automatically. And you definitely want to avoid that and be very careful, especially if you're not dealing with like a dozen genes, but maybe a few hundred genes. It's very easy to have these mistakes automatically replicate. And there have been studies recently who have screened um, uh, supplementary tables of uh, high-impact journals and showing how much these tables are affected by date conversion. So this is by fairly widespread. And when you, when you look at gene identifiers in large-scale experiments, you will most likely face issues with having 100% coverage, because if you have hundreds of genes you analyze, sooner or later a few of them might be obsolete in terms of their identifiers or not, found, not be found by a pathway analysis tool. So if you really care about gene, your gene list deeply, you should uh, just go through these uh, manually and make sure that all the identifiers are mapped uh, automatically uh, in the pathway tool. And if not, then you maybe sh uh, should Google around a little bit and, uh, and find what the actual identifier for a gene is. Um, there are uh, public services or the software tools that allow you to convert multiple kinds of identifiers. Um, this is uh, the gProfiler server uh, where you can use uh, uh, like literally hundreds of types of identifiers to map to other ty hundreds of types of identifiers, uh, both in human and many other species. Um, and uh, this would handle the majority of different kinds of identifiers for you. Certain exceptions are obviously there. And it will allow you to use a mix of identifiers as input and then uh, get an output of a, of a specific kind of an identifier. 
and if there are multiple aliases, then that, those would be revealed to you as well. So much of uh, gene identifiers, and I really hope that uh, you won't need to spend a lot of time of them in, in your practical research, but this is definitely something to pay attention to. Are there any questions before I'm going to the next stop? Is there some sort of tool that you can, as opposed to manually editing each gene, if you have, let's say, a gene list of three <coughs> genes, is there any tool you can do that you can use to like, input this gene list and at least see if they're all being picked up and then be able to look at them individually? So that will allow you to see if they're all actually <laughs> to some sort of. Yeah, the, the G profiler, G convert tool might do it for you. And uh, there is a feature where um, if there's multiple equivalent identifiers, it may actually offer or ask you which one you think it is. But, uh, you know, it has its restrictions as well. Not always will it work. And there are certain identifiers that are purely numeric. And for those, you need to, be, you need to know in advance which database they're coming from because numeric identifiers, um, at first sight, they won't be separated from one another. So the second really important component, uh, or really the core component of pathway enrichment analysis uh, is gene sets and gene annotations. So this is the uh, public knowledge uh, that allows us to do this type of analysis coming from uh, you know, databases and previous studies and careful expert curation and so forth. So cell is a complex machine. Uh, it involves uh, you know, concerted activity of many different genes and many different processes and functions and cell components. Um, so in order to uh, perform pathway enrichment analysis, we use gene sets that have been previously compiled using uh, our knowledge of how the cell works. And then uh, there are massive expert teams that curate existing knowledge and previous, uh, previous studies in order to compile gene lists that are representative of our understanding of, uh, of biology, both on the cellular side and on the organismal side as well. Um, so gene sets are available from multiple uh, sources, uh, public databases. Uh, gene ontology is one of the most important ones that we will discuss, uh, discuss next. Um, so there are different uh, databases out there that provide you with this information, um, and then dif different kinds of information as well. So pathways and biological processes would be most valuable type of a resource that's most <coughs> applicable for different kinds of omics analysis, but you can also use other kinds of annotations. Um, so in gene ontology, there are three groups of no, uh, gene sets representing biological processes, molecular functions, and cell locations. You could also imagine that in certain contexts, you may want to look at different parts of the chromosome, which genes are annotated there, and do an enrichment analysis on that. You could uh, collect a gene list that are corresponding to different human diseases, perform enrich enrichment tests on those gene lists, and so on and so forth. Uh, but um, in practice, we would recommend that if you do a pathway enrichment analysis, you would start with a, a fairly basic set of pathways and, uh, and processes, those representing gene ontology biological process group, and then pathway databases such as Reactome or KEG that are uh, most useful in the largest majority of uh, genomics analysis. And now, depending on the additional questions you ask, you may want to look at things like uh, genes targeted by the same transcription factor or proteins targeted by the same kinase, depending on what your experiment is about. So what is the gene ontology? Gene ontology is like a structured dictionary. And so it is a collection of keywords of various kinds of biological processes, molecular functions, and cell components that researchers have uh, developed over time. So for, for example, um, apoptosis would be um, a biological process. Membrane would be a cell component, and protein kinase or kinase activity would be a molecular function. So besides gene ontology being a dictionary, it's also a structured dictionary. So between these various terms, there are associations or links, because there would be certain parts of the gene ontology that represent very, fairly specific knowledge, and other parts of the gene ontology that uh, represent very general knowledge. So uh, the, the dictionary is a hier hierarchical structure, so more uh, specific uh, terminology links to more general terminology. Um, so here's an example of the Go structure. Gene ontology is structured uh, almost like a tree, uh, except that uh, it's called a directed acyclic graph, uh, which means that uh, 
each node in the tree can have multiple parents. And uh, here's an example as well. Uh, say B cell apoptosis is a very, a very specific kind of cell death, uh, but uh, and it's a it's a speci specific uh, node in the Go tree. Um, and uh, um, this is a B cell apoptosis is a kind of an apoptosis, and you can see as you can see. Um, um, I don't think I have a pointer, do I? Um, B cell apoptosis is a kind of an apoptosis, which in turn is a kind of a programmed cell death, and uh, and further on it's a kind of cell physiological process. So um, scientists have developed this uh, uh, set of uh, terminology, and each one of those uh, uh, terms would have a list of genes annotated to them, which would uh, give us the gene sets that we can use in a pathway enrichment analysis context. So what does Go cover? As we mentioned, it covers cellular components, molecular functions, and biological processes, um, and they're structured in a, in a way that uh, can be machine interpretable um, and perform for, for any enrichment analysis tools. One of the components is terms, and those terms come from uh, uh, expert curation who routinely screen literature and add these terms as, a, as a, our knowledge gets more specific about biology. Um, and there are also uh, occasional large-scale developments of the gene ontology where major parts of the gene ontology get deleted, a lot of terms get added and rearranged. As you can see from the plot uh, on the right, this is a highly dynamic system. Uh, as uh, more and more studies get published, our uh, knowledge of cellular organization increases and therefore more and more terms get added over time. Which also tells you that uh, pathway enrichment analysis performed today are more likely to be invalid in a few years' time, or at least they will be representing only a majority of knowledge, because our knowledge increases and these, uh, uh, these results will change over time. Um, the second part that we mostly care about here is, uh, is how genes get annotated to these uh, hierarchical uh, uh, dictionaries. Um, though those also get uh, annotated by expert curations, uh, but also uh, all very semi-automatic and full, uh, fully automatic uh, procedures. So these are known as gene associations or Go annotations uh, and they tell us how genes function, uh, in which processes they're involved, uh, in which cell components they get expressed and so on and so forth. And uh, as a rule there are multiple annotations per gene. One is that genes are involved in multiple processes and functions but also because of this hierarchical annotation where there are more specific and more general representations of the same process in gene ontology. Uh, and it's important to notice that not all Go annotations are assigned by experts. Uh, experts actually assign only a, a minority of Go terms and that there's a lot of uh, statistical analysis and cu curation and, uh, and um, uh, automatic uh, labeling happening, especially in, uh, in non-human organisms. Uh, so here's an example why a particular gene usually would have many, many different Go annotations. Uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, uh, the Go is represented as a, as a sort of a tree where there are general and specific terms. And uh, say a, a researcher has annotated a particular gene to a particular term in this hierarchical tree. Say Aurora kinase B is known to be uh, involved in B-cell apoptosis. And then by the definition of uh, ontology, or the definition of this hierarchical dictionary, uh, that gene is also annotated to each uh, parent node uh, above that specific B cell apoptosis. And this is kind of natural because if, if a gene is involved in uh, B cell apoptosis, it is also involved in cell death in general. Uh, but uh, this leads to a high redundancy of pathway enrichment analysis, which means that if you have a rich gene set coming from a uh, rich gene list coming from uh, a well designed experiment, then it's quite likely that you will receive a lot of pathway enrichment results, but many of them will resemble each other because they represent uh, fairly similar areas of the gene ontology. Um, why is it important to fill the gene sets? When you look at the tree where there are specific terms and very general terms in the gene ontology, um, then it turns out that uh, there are thousands of very highly specific code terms with very few genes annotated to them. Because our knowledge of biology is getting increasingly detailed and you know people could spend their entire career studying a particular gene or process of interest and therefore uh, our, these annotations can get really very well detailed. Uh, on the other hand, 
because all of the annotations of gene function are, are propagated upwards towards the tree, then at the very top of the tree there are these uh, very general nodes or very general terms that are, are not very informative but they contain thousands or even tens of thousands of genes. So uh, as an extreme example, the Go node uh, uh, biological process, the biological process would contain all genes uh, in that particular species. So uh, therefore it's important to uh, apply certain filters when you do a pathway enrichment analysis you may want to exclude uh, very small terms such as those that have only one or two or five genes and you may also want to exclude the terms that have uh, maybe 10,000 or 5,000 or 1,000 terms um, and then there are several reasons for those filters one is a statistical reason uh, if you do an analysis over thousands and thousands of potential pathways which are all highly interrelated uh, then you uh, increase your multiple testing penalties so you should be more cautious about each individual results because you conducted so many tests uh, on the other hand uh, there's this biological interpretation issue as well so see, see, say you have your uh, enrichment results from pathway analysis and they're enriched in the biological process that doesn't help you much in understanding what your data set is about uh, but also these large-scale nodes at the very top of the tree uh, can lead to statistical inflation, which means that because they're so large, they may get uh, very significant p-values purely because there's so many genes are involved. And so a good practice would be, before you even conduct your pathway enrichment analysis, you set aside the very, very general terms and the very, very uh, small and specific terms. Um, so where do the annotations uh, come from? Uh, the best ones of them come from manual annotation of, uh, of existing literature and then uh, an expert would, uh, uh, would evaluate the literature and perhaps assign a score uh, or a particular label to a gene being involved in a particular process uh, depending on what kind of evidence is available. Maybe there was a few mutant phenotype then there's a fairly strong association between the gene and the process but maybe it was only based on sequence similarity of that gene then one could argue that the evidence is weaker. Um, a large am amount of these annotations or, uh, or predicted functions of genes are coming from automated uh, curation that, that evaluates all kinds of databases and literature uh, and doesn't really involve expert curation. And this is particularly uh, common in uh, less annotated model organisms where a large bulk of gene annotations would just be <coughs> inferred from other species where more careful experiments have been conducted. And it's generally assumed that many of those electronic annotations could be of lower quality, so it's just something to be mindful of. When you're analyzing your pathway enrichment data and you see a lot of results uh, unfolding, then it might be worth just evaluating whether the underlying evidence is entirely uh, automated annotation or if there's actually some experimental annotations that come from uh, detailed studies of that gene. And so here's an example of various evidence types that get annotated to particular genes being involved in certain processes. So they could be coming from uh, experimental evidence, uh, either high, high throughput or low throughput experimental evidence, or perhaps computational analysis of existing data uh, or, or sequence homology between uh, you know, related species, uh, or just based on literature curation, such as like author X uh, in a particular study said that this gene is involved in that process. Um, so, uh, in a particular pathway enrichment analysis, you just want to pay attention and observe what are your results about. Um, some tools such as G-Profiler would allow you to uh, uh, understand these annotations on the fly. For example, here we use colored evidence code of gene annotations to understand uh, in a pathway enrichment result which genes would be annotated using which kind of evidence, whether it would be experimental evidence uh, or computational evidence that associates a gene and a particular function. So briefly mentioned this already, uh, that uh, the gene annotations and pathways, and this is a dynamic system, it evolves over time. Um, so one of the studies in my lab involved the question of whether um, using pathway tools uh, with uh, uh, recent and not so recent databases of gene functions affects our results. And the first thing we asked was, yes? I will use these terms here interchangeably. Uh, 
the, the difference would be perhaps that the gene sets can be all kinds of gene sets, not necessarily pathways. You could look at the microRNA targets or uh, chromosomal regions, while pathway enrichment analysis would focus on gene sets that are representative of pathways. It, uh, I, I would say that perhaps that definition depends on with what type of input data do you give and what type of results would you like to get out. Uh, the statistical methodology would be mostly the same. Uh, any other questions that I can answer quickly? All right, uh, back to a best before date of gene annotation databases. So at this point, a very popular tool uh, that was used was David, uh, and we asked uh, when was David last updated relative to the date of this analysis. Uh, and then it turned out that um, um, at that point in the past, uh, David was updated uh, uh, five years ago, um, while it was the by far the most cited pathway enrichment analysis tool, uh, indicating that that tool had been frequently used in various omics analysis. Um, so that leads to the question of whether uh, the data sets representing uh, pathways and networks and biological process had evolved uh, since the five years when David was last updated. Um, so we asked how much, how much would a practical uh, researcher uh, benefit from having up-to-date databases in their pathway enrichment tools compared to out-of-date pathways. Um, and then this was published um, shortly thereafter where it turned out that if you use an outdated pathway enrichment analysis tool to analyze your current omics data, you may actually use up to 80% of your pathway enrichment results purely because pathway definitions and gene set definitions have evolved over, uh, they have evolved fairly rapidly over time. And therefore, if you use a tool that employs these outdated databases, none of the new uh, gene annotations will be used and uh, you will just miss out on your gene interpretations uh, that come from more recent studies. So in other words, uh, you, if you use a pathway enrichment analysis tool, that there are many of them available online, uh, you should definitely look when that was last updated and whether that update was a, or was a regular type of an update. Because this really matters of what kind of uh, knowledge you can get out of your pathway enrichment analysis. So is David updated after your paper? Uh, David was updated uh, uh, after we released our uh, preprint on bioarchive, uh, but I think uh, that was that. So since then, they haven't updated it again, and it has been a few years. Um, so why would they be so more used than the other ones? Something about it, the, I would say that they have uh, had an advantage of being, you know, first. That I don't think that they do statistically something more sophisticated. It's about like what the community uses and uh, the ease of use and what they recommend to others to be used. It's often the case that uh, many equivalent tools, one of them will, for some reason, gain an advantage and uh, uh, it will remain so and ex uh, expand over time. I think it's also fair to say that uh, updating tools requires uh, uh, resources and effort, and not always are, are these resources and efforts provided by funders. So in order to maintain a tool, you need to have people working on it and funding, and uh, maybe David didn't have that. Uh, onwards, uh, we have been talking about gene set enrichment analysis, pathway enrichment analysis. Uh, it is worth actually asking what this is statistically about. Um, there are many types of gene set enrichment tests. Uh, the most common, common of them, them would be a Fisher's exact test or a hypergeometric test that would evaluate the enrichment of genes in your experimentally derived list, uh, and those genes that are enriched are having a certain biological function. We already went through this uh, slide once, uh, where we compare your gene list from an experiment in blue uh, and a certain list of annotated gene from a particular database, um, and ask if the overrepresentation of a function in annotated genes is statistically significant. And because you have many pathways or many gene sets, as we looked at the gene ontology earlier, then you conduct this analysis multiple times. Uh, if you conduct something multiple, if you conduct the statistical test multiple times, you need to be more cautious about it. You apply a false discovery rate in order to be more cautious. And then based on those uh, results of enriched uh, pathways and processes, you may derive your hypothesis for follow-up work or um, or publishing a paper. So what's a typical experimental test about? Uh, 
So here in, uh, in this light brown or beige color uh, on the left, you see the entire list of genes. Uh, so that would be considered the experimentally detectable list of background genes. Uh, for example, if you're doing RNA-seq experiment, that might be all protein coding genes in that species. And then a subset of those lists uh, is the experimentally positive genes, so perhaps those that you detected as being significantly upregulated in your, in your uh, you know, uh, case control study. Yeah. And then you take those uh, yellow genes or the upregulated genes, uh, and then you pass them on to a, a gene enrichment test that uses gene set databases or pathway databases uh, from the literature, such as the gene ontology. Um, and then uh, the gene enrichment test accounts for uh, the yellow genes, but also the beige genes. So it will uh, account for the enrichments given the background set of genes, uh, and it will conduct um, a separate statistical test for each one of those gene sets and come back with a short list of gene sets that represent biological processes and pathways that are specifically enriched in your experimental data. So a little bit of a detail, what's a typical enrichment uh, test do? It, it assesses the probability that by random sampling of an equivalent list of genes in size, uh, you would see as many genes of a particular biological process uh, that you actually saw. So uh, you could uh, conduct this experiment easily, uh, or computation experiment easily, uh, using statistical uh, programming by just sampling the random genes of that size and seeing how often do you observe a particular uh, functionally annotated gene to uh, arise. Um, Fisher's exact test, though, doesn't require you to, do, to perform that random sampling, but it uh, uh, has an analytical derivative to, to determine how many genes would you expect in, in the equivalent gene sizes and how unlikely it is to observe in a random chance. So therefore, Fisher's exact test is really fast and you can run it across multiple gene sets. So here's a contingency table uh, for this particular enrichment test. So you're measuring essentially two binary properties, yes or no. Uh, is a gene part of your experiment? Yes or no? Was it detected significantly, uh, significantly high, for example? And does that gene belong to a pathway or not, uh, a specific pathway? And then these categories are respectively A, B, C, and D. And then uh, using the hypergeometric distribution, which you don't really need to know, uh, we determine how likely it is to for as, uh, you know, have as many genes that are both in the pathway and your experimental list of genes. It is also very important to pay attention to what the background is. So when you run a pathway analysis uh, online, then by default, the background usually is the list of protein coding genes in that species. Uh, or maybe the list of protein coding genes that has at least one Go annotation. Um, and that, uh, that uh, background set is appropriate in the vast majority of cases. Uh, however, it can lead to very dangerous uh, statistical inflation of results if you actually weren't able to analyze all genes in the background using your experimental procedure. So if you're unable to detect several genes uh, using your experimental procedure, you should make sure that your background list is also appropriately shorter. So an example of that would be a phosphoproteomics experiment, uh, where the results are phosphorylated peptides that in turn represent all phosphoproteins, but those phosphoproteins only s represent a subset of all known proteins. Therefore, in order to do a pathway enrichment analysis pro appropriately, you need to limit your background list to all phosphoproteins and not just all proteins. Uh, because if you consider that larger list of all proteins, then certain categories would be systematically getting higher p-values. So depending on how you do this experiment, the background list may be fairly easy to uh, determine or quite difficult. So if you have an experimental platform that only measures one type of uh, gene or one type of protein, that type of protein should be part of your background and, uh, and other protein shouldn't. So when you uh, consider there's multiple types of experiments that are not essentially genome-wide, and then you need to carefully deal with the background. So you define the background. Didn't define the background as a standard, it's an all protein coding, that is the baseline standard. Right. So if you had a targeted panel, mm -hmm. say, exactly. And the targeted panel only had, you know, if you have had sets of genes selected for various reasons, how would you select that background? Because it's not mm -hmm. necessarily selected a type of like a phosphor. Right. Or that's not the, mm -hmm. the well, if you know the composition of your background uh, of your panel, that becomes the background. Mm 
because uh, you didn't measure any other genes that wasn't part of the panel. Therefore, that gene in no way could end up in your gene list. Therefore, the, the background becomes the panel. Um, uh, and, you know, in theory, that's the same statistical exercise applies even if you have a fairly small panel, like 500 genes. Uh, but, like, obviously the numbers will, will shrink. Yeah. And uh, a good pathway analysis tool would also distinguish uh, the gene sets that don't have any members of that panel. So those would be set aside and not analyzed. It, it is a, this panel is a fairly easy example because you, you, you know what is on your panel and therefore you can put on this, all these genes into your background and nothing else. But there could be some more subtle uh, uh, definitions of the background such as genes that you wouldn't be able to detect although you are trying to do a genome-wide analysis but genes that you won't be detecting. Uh, one is that, for example an RNA-seq experiment there will be genes below your detection limit whose transcripts you cannot capture because of your read. Now, is it, uh, is it correct to exclude those genes from your background or should you still keep them in? So this is, there is I don't think there is a clear cut answer to that. So now we're going to go through multiple testing corrections. Uh, which is uh, a tool everyone should use as long as they're conducting more than a handful of statistical tests. And then that's it. this is usually true whenever you're uh, looking into genomics data or any type of omics data because you have a lot of data and therefore you be, need to be cautious about any single finding in that data because you have so many, uh, so many measurements. So how do we win the p-value lottery? Uh, imagine that this is um, you know, a simplified example of pathway enrichment analysis there's 500 black genes representing a particular pathway uh, and 4,500 red genes that are not representing that pathway. So then you do a pathway enrichment test um, and ask if the pathway is enriched, but you could do the same on the completely random genes. So you have this bowl of uh, genes, you randomly pull out a few genes, and the majority of cases you should see that the red balls or the red genes are dominating because they make up the majority of the gene population. Um, and therefore, the corresponding uh, statistical significance or p-value would not be uh, strong or significant because uh, you see a, a balanced or expected proportion of red and, uh, and uh, black balls. But you can do this many times, and in genomics you do this many times. And every once in a while, maybe, you know, almost 8,000 draws later, you will end up with a result that looks nominally significant. So because it's representing... Um, the mo most of the genes would be uh, colored black, but the, in the population they are the minor minority. So if, the, if you take this at face value, you would say, well, this is a very strong enrichment because you wouldn't expect to see as many uh, black balls or black genes in the population. Uh, but then, because you do, do, did so many random draws, this just uh, happens by chance. So if you do many, many analyses, then every once in a while you should expect so something to emerge that looks very significant at face value, and therefore you need to be more conservative about each test you do and downgrade each test you do in order to account for the, the uh, attempt to win the p-value lottery. Uh, this is the practical pathway anal analysis case. So you have a fixed list of genes, say RRP6, MRD1, and so on and so forth, and you conduct many tests. Each time a test would be a different type of an annotation. So first you, you deal with black and red balls, then you do deal deal with the shape, whether it's a circular or, or um, a rectangular um, gene, and so on and so forth. Because you do many tests, you are bound to find some results that look significant. And this is the reasoning to do multiple testing correction, uh, which in essence takes every p-value uh, from a particular test and makes it a little, a little bit more weaker or downgrades that p-value. The simplest type of a p-value correction for multiple testing is called the Bonferroni correction. And this was developed before the Second World War, so it's here mostly to just demonstrate how simple it is. But practically, Bonferroni correction is considered too stringent, um, and it's not applied in practice in genomics these days. But the ba basic principle is the following. Uh, we have um, a certain number of M tests that we conduct, and those M may represent all different kinds of pathways that we analyze for a particular gene list. Um, and each, each pathway will derive a, some original p-value, and in order to correct p-values, correct we multiply each of them by m. Um, 
so they become m times less significant. If we run 100 tests, then each p-value will be multiplied by 100, and obviously um, that makes the majority of results much, much less significant. And anything that survives that uh, Bonferroni correction uh, and is still nominally significant, say at 0 0.05, will be then uh, considered a significant rich pathway post-multiple testing correction. Um, and then this, uh, this kind of a test is called the family-wise error rate, uh, which means that uh, there's a probability that in your result that at least one or more of the results that are remain false positives, so they are there only due to random chance. So if you have a large number of results, then after the Bonferroni FDR correction, you believe that there's at least one result or more that remains still a false positive regardless of your multiple testing correction. So this is like a caveat of that analysis. But it's actually a fairly stringent uh, consideration be because if you even have a very large number of results and you maintain that one or more re remain wrong, then that one or more may be a fairly weak condition to have. Hi. So for the M, that's going to be not like the total number of genes observed across uh, the gene set, but the specific set of genes that you're interested in comparing a statistical so test. In. If you if you had like uh, say 100 gene sets, each one representing a different pathway, which is normal when you do a pathway enrichment analysis, then M would be the number of these different pathways you just tested. Okay. So you always have a one list of genes coming from like say a RNA seq experiment, uh, but you interrogate that RNA seq experiment using a large number of pathways. Just finding like a smaller subset that are very interesting, you test many of them at a time. And here the M is the number of pathways you test. So you will result in having M tests, but because M is large, then each test you should be more cautious about or more conservative about. Um, so, as I mentioned, most people would not uh, run a Bonferroni test these days, uh, but instead they would run a, a, a Benjamini Hochberg uh, uh, false discovery rate, which is a, a slightly more complex algorithm, uh, but it, it is less conservative, so it would maintain more significant pathways, uh, and it would uh, allow you to perhaps conduct a less stringent test. Okay, so this this we already discussed uh, because it's very fairly stringent, it can wash away real enrichments and lead to false <coughs> negatives. Uh, then you would be able to you would take a less stringent test using a different algorithm, but also um, allow to accept a less stringent condition, the false discovery rate, and that leads to a gentler uh, gentler correction and would just give you more results in return, but with a caveat that maybe a, a larger amount of them would be potential false positives. So FTR, or false discovery rate, is the expected proportion of the observed enrichments due to random chance. So that would be perhaps 5%. So if your FTR cutoff is 0 0.05, then that means that you assume that no more than 5% of your results uh, could be wrong. Maybe none of them, but up to 5%. And then compare, compare that to Bonferroni, which says that any one of the observed enrichments could be by random chance. So the, the typical FDR procedure is the Benjamini Hopper procedure, and that's more, uh, much more recent. That was in the in the 90s, not uh, not in the 30s. And the FDR threshold is also called sometimes a Q value, and sometimes it's also called the adjusted P value and the FDR value. So uh, these usually they re represent the same thing, and unfortunately, people often even in their own papers they use multiple terminologies. Uh, but what you need to know is that they attempted to correct for multiple testing in these cases. And uh, as a side note, I would be cautious about genomics papers that do not do multiple testing correction because you almost always need to do, the moment you have multiple tests, you need to correct for multiple testing. Hi. By doing, um, yes, by doing these corrections, aren't you increasing your likelihood of making a type 2 error? Uh, so uh, leading to false negatives? Yeah. Uh, you might. Uh, for sure, uh, but uh, uh, I, I think this is a, a smaller sin compared to having many, many false uh, positives due to multiple testing. I guess in my mind, I'd rather have like a, a longer list of things that I could try to validate and determine whether it's. It, it'd be easier to you know cross things off a list than to 
not know have something that's never on the list to begin with. No. It depends if your list, your validation test costs you thousands of dollars. <laughs> Um, pathway analysis is notorious for garbage in, garbage out. Uh, so uh, you could, uh, if you doubt the value of ma false discovery correction, then you could disable it, take a completely random list of genes, run it through a um, like pathway analysis and see what comes out. And uh, my, my bet is that something will come out and you could uh, construct a story around it and that's a fairly uh, dangerous practice. Um, and this is actually, like, if FDR doesn't work for you for some reason and you doubt that it um, um, gives you additional insights, then a this is a very brute FDR test, but generate some random data and run exactly the same procedure as you would with the real data and see what it delivers. And if it delivers more than your real data, then you're in trouble. So uh, basically an FDR correction using empirical randomly generated data is always uh, a good look to uh, understand how many false positives are you actually delivering. But why don't we walk through this Benjamin Hochberg example? It's a little bit uh, uh, involved. Um, so when you run a pathway enrichment analysis, prior to collect, uh, correction, you will receive the p-value for each gene set you test or each pathway you test. And say the nominal p-values are here ranked from the most significant <coughs> one to the least significant one. So what the Benjamin Hofer uh, uh, FTR correction does is that it first um, uh, takes these nominal p-values and uh, multiplies them by their uh, relative ranking in the gene list. So if we have, uh, uh, not gene list, but pathway list, if we have uh, 53 pathways tested, uh, we rank them uh, from the most significant to the least significant, uh, then we multiply them by, uh, you know, the, their inverted rank. So 53 divided by 1, 53 divided by 2, and so forth until 53 divided by 53. Uh, so th um, then each one of those adjusted p-values will become um, will become the one of the steps in the correction. As you can see, then uh, it sort of flattens out the distribution. Each p-value will uh, it becomes um, a more discrete uh, distribution of p-values at the at the right edge. That's 0 0.03. 53, 53, 53, 40, and so on. And now the the procedure will identify uh, um, a, an adjusted p-value that is uh, lower than the ones that are above it, and then will up-propagate it. So you can see how 0 0.04 is up-propagated to uh, the ter the pathways that initially had a stronger p-value from the unadjusted tests and that that becomes a cutoff then uh, because we we were seeking to identify p-values uh, that after correction would be less than 0 0.05 so then the nominal p-value that uh, initially was derived 0 0.031 indicated by the arrow uh, is the least significant finding and everything below it would be considered non-significant so uh, the following this test, only the four first results would be considered significant and the others would not. Uh, so this is a more gentle correction compared to the Bonferroni, where you brutally just uh, multiply each p-value by the number of tests you conducted. And uh, you can see that you actually derive uh, more results from this um, analysis compared to a particular Bonferroni test. You don't need to uh, ever implement this by hand because in, in statistical packages this would be just a single command. So you're saying only the first four are significant. Right. But those four did not force. So does that mean that initiation of transcription is significant? And then some other 0.04 somewhere somewhere that you're not showing us? Or are those 0.04s applied to transcription? Because it was uh, up-propagated, then only those four would remain significant. So you're saying that, that basically the <coughs> factors, transcription, or, uh, transcriptional regulation, transcription factor, initiation of transcription, those ones are the ones that are significant. Right. But, the, but I'm not sure I understand why. <coughs> because their p-values were higher than 0.01. Initial p-values were higher, but after you uh, correct them by their rank, they were not. So higher rank. So okay, the higher rank puts them at a. Okay, so you're missing. Oh, all right, all right, I see. But I'm not sure I understand why you're doing it that way. But I. I right. So uh, I'm not doing this, uh, and. Uh, 
I think the bottom line is that initially people developed the FTR based on, on, on a large series of uh, random samplings of how we would uh, observe p-values to come out and then they developed an analytical procedure to, uh, to replicate uh, that random sampling at the closest rate. So with, uh, with such a uh, test you want to, this to run quickly. If you doubt that it works you have to do a permutation test which is more expensive to run. Uh, why do we compare FDR with 5%? Uh, the, the percentage is up to the researcher to decide very often. 5% is, is often the most common uh, significance cutoff that you could choose. Uh, people also use 0.1 or 0.01. Mm -hmm. And then this is something that you determine in advance. You say, I will trust results that are significant at 0.05. And the assumption is that 5% of your results could be wrong. And hopefully you did a power analysis before you started the experiment by saying that I will look for results at that significance level and how, how likely it is that I will replicate them in a different analysis. And from where do you get the rank number? The rank number? Yeah. This is usually the algorithm will do it for you. Uh, you mean that uh, 53 divided by 153 no, divided by... Uh, the very first column. Um, this is based on the nominal test. So, so the first uh, pathway enrichment analysis will consider each pathway at a time, compute the p-value for each pathway, and then you rank your pathways based on that p-value from the most significant to the least significant. And then you correct it by, by each rank and up propagate. <coughs> So here are a few uh, practical notes. When you correct the, the p-value, then the strength of the correction will always depend on how many tests you were running. If you tested 10,000 pathways, your correction will always be more stringent. So uh, a good way to deal with this is actually predefine your search base in advance. If you don't need to test 10,000 pathways, but you are you can focus on a narrower set of 1,000, then that will lead to less stringent correction and there, therefore perhaps more results. So uh, this is one reason why you uh, may want to start with uh, biological processes and molecular pathways and not analyze all other types of gene sets because you will need to deal with more stringent multiple testing correction that will lead to uh, perhaps more false negatives. And the second question is of, of course uh, interpretation. Um, so now fairly quickly uh, why would we need to, what else would we need to do in order to really be able to interpret our pathway enrichment and analysis results? Um, and then I, I'd like to describe a particular way called the enrichment map, which uses network-based visualization in order to uh, uh, visualize pathways, uh, reduce redundancy, and therefore enable better interpretation. So the gene ontology and also pathway databases have a lot of redundancy in them. One is that pathway, pathways and biological processes are not always very well defined, so they have overlaps between them, but also the redundancy problem of uh, uh, multiple specificity layers in the gene ontology tree, where there are specific nodes and uh, general nodes, and they're all interlinked, and they all cover very similar sets of genes. Uh, and the, when you use a mix of different pathway databases, then the same pathway may be characterized using different terminology in different uh, databases as well. Uh, so, therefore, the results very often look like this. You have uh, dozens or hundreds of uh, pathways that have a statistically significant enrichment, uh, but when you just browse the few first top ones, they seem to be saying the same thing all the time, with slight variations uh, of specificity. So in order to overcome that, uh, there are multiple techniques, but one of them is a visualization technique called the enrichment map, uh, which will uh, cluster together similar pathways into these little sub-networks. Um, here every node you see or circle uh, is one specific uh, uh, gene set or path pathway and it's connected to another gene set or pathway uh, by this green edge if the two share a significant proportion of genes. So the assumption is that if they have more or less the same genes they would be also biologically fairly similar. And then uh, you, you couple that principle with an automated network layout 
and that will pull together the pathways that are fairly similar and then they start to represent uh, a biological theme rather than a group of uh, very, very related pathways. Um, so here's a motivating example. Um, a, a few years back we were in, involved in, in a study of uh, uh, pediatric brain cancers and adult brain cancers is called ependymoma. Um, and uh, then the primary way of diagnosing uh, that ependymoma is based on pathology and, uh, and imaging. And um, um, that particular group in Germany collected a large amount of uh, molecular data, transcriptomic data, and methylation data um, in order to the, dis discover molecular subtypes uh, that are coming out of that uh, uh, molecular data uh, clustering. And they found nine subtypes of ependymoma that represent different, you know, patient age groups and uh, and different uh, uh, prognosis and severity of disease. So there were hundreds of genes expressed in each one of those subtypes. So we were seeking, seeking to use pathway, enri pathway enrichment analysis and visualization to uh, outline these different pathways involved in the, in the cancer subtypes. Um, and then here's a, a pathway enrichment map where each group of nodes is a similar uh, biological set of biological processes and pathways, and each color represents a particular uh, subtype of that uh, disease. Uh, and sometimes you see nodes that are, have only one color, that would be uh, a pathway that's representative of only one single uh, type of, uh, subtype of cancer. Uh, and then the multicolored nodes would be pathways that are upregulated in multiple kinds of, or multiple subtypes of that disease. So this is a fairly compact overview and much easier to understand than like large spreadsheets of pathways for these individual tumor subtypes. So this type of visualization obviously needs a little bit of manual curation, but uh, uh, but the input is uh, is uh, constructed automatically using the Cytoscape uh, enrichment map app, which we will also practice during this next um, uh, tutorial. So very briefly, what is Cytoscape? Um, Cytoscape is a is an open source uh, platform or a Java program that runs on your computer that it enables uh, network visualization uh, of uh, biological networks. So what is a network? Uh, in a very core way, network is a set of interactions. Uh, so the relationships on the left, so perhaps A and A1 and A2 are genes. If they're interacting of, of some way, then the conceptually, uh, this is just a set of pairs of genes. You can visualize that as a network, uh, where the edges might have uh, like different annotations or weights. Or you could also visualize this as a two-dimensional matrix or a heat map. They're kind of computationally they're equivalent but the network representation may have some additional characteristics because we are uh, very good at visual perception and we could uh, just analyze networks visually and understand the underlying trends. Um, so what are the key ideas in network visualization? One idea is layout. Uh, if you just look at the network, it could be a fuzzy hairball, but if you use a automated layout, it may actually reveal its underlying structure in a in a meaningful way. And in Cytoscape you have a large abundance of different automated layouts that will help you to interpret those uh, uh, by, just by eye. The other aspect is that uh, uh, we have a wealth of information in omics experiments and we can assign that dif to different properties uh, in the network. One very uh, easy one is that if you have an important gene in the network you may want to give it the larger size uh, of that node or maybe you want to use a brighter color. So some of those examples are shown here. If you just load in a network into Cytoscape, it may look very hard to interpret, but perhaps um, uh, you assign colors to, to genes of a particular pathway, um, and then you use an automated layout that will pull together uh, genes that are, have many connections among themselves and pull apart genes that have fewer connections. Um, and then you could move from the image on the, uh, on the left to the image on the right, and you can see that you know, nodes of the same color start to cluster together, maybe representing the pathway or a protein complex. And, and then there's a wealth of visual attributes you can assign in Cytoscape. You can uh, essentially color uh, all parts of the network or maybe use different fonts or different lines. Um, and uh, there's a lot of creativity in this process, but some of that can be also automated, as, as you can see from the enrichment map tutorial coming soon. Um, so that concludes uh, this uh, lecture part.